Hey everybody, welcome back to Comedian MTG. If you're watching this, you're watching part two of my two color tier list series where I'm breaking down every color combination for commanders in CEDH and going over the commanders that are relevant for CEDH play. Now, if you're watching this video, I assume you've seen part one and if you haven't, you should pause and go watch that right in this link that I'm gonna throw right up there. Uh, but yeah, you should watch part one first that goes over a lot of the base of like how I'm going to evaluate stuff. Right now, we're just going to jump into part two and start telling you what I think of these two color commanders for CEDH. Tati Ova, another super, super underrated strategy in CEDH. There's been a couple people who like will pick up the deck, will master it, will put up really good results with it, and then it disappears off the face of the earth for like a year or two. Probably a little better in a more mid-range heavy metagame. And I think people will have the payoff of this card if they devote enough time into it. It's also tough because you have to really balance the building it like a casual EDH deck with like just shoving it full of land effects and like thinking that'll win you a CDH game and playing good clean interaction and playing pieces that aren't going to contradict your own pieces. Because of that, there's a bit of awkwardness with it. But Tatio was really strong. I think it's super underrated the fact that it like won the first ddm event like way way back in the day and then like hasn't put up a result since then is kind of baffling to me i think it's super solid and it's always a deck that i'm like very respectful of at the table and i would love to see someone like pilot it again because i think it's good it might be another archetype that's like kind of a snooze fest right it's not like very entertaining you play a land you draw a card you play some interaction you play a land you draw a card take another turn play a mystic sanctuary draw a card like it's it's that over and over again ghostly flicker is like a cool combo um and that's the thing these while i'm describing these things as like not the most attractive options i think they're really interesting like i think ghostly flicker mystical sanctuary loops are really really cool i think taking infinite turns with your like six boards in the battlefield and like doing the whole blue green value engine thing is really cool and I think it's a very solid way of doing it. I just think that people kind of gave up on it and people do have a recency bias when it comes to Commander. So I'm not surprised to see this card just sort of fall off. That being said, I think it's like probably here. Yeah, probably like right here. Um, Arami feels low. It's a really strong card. Yeah, my, my argument about Niv earlier stands, but I think Arami's probably like up here because it does the thing pretty well. Uh, it does some pretty nasty stuff if you get it going. Yeah, that feels that feels a little better. Now we're going to talk about probably the worst Demir deck we're going to talk about today. Uh, Lazav. At some point, people were making like Basalt Monolith, Mesmeric or Mill Your Entire Library, do a Dread Return combo in blue-black. Uh, I, I only brought it up today because I know it was a deck people were playing. It was popularized, I think, on the Spike Feeders. They, they played this deck a couple times. It's definitely like a deck I am suspicious of type of thing. Speaking of which, I actually got to reorder this category because I haven't been putting this in order. Kinnon. Here's going to be our first non-blue-black A. Probably, once again, I think Nimrus is very, very underrated. So I'm probably going to put Kinnon like here. But know that this interaction here is super... Actually, no. I think that would be super disrespectful for Kinnon. Kinnon is probably the best blue-green commander. One of the best two-color commanders that exists. It went on a spree when it was first printed. Just putting up like result after result in the hands of different pilots. It top 16 uh, tier one con, I think was in the top four maybe of the first tier one con. Um, it won several tournaments. Uh, there were several pilots who were like kin and mains that were just like crushing it in tournament after tournament after tournament. And not only that existed, but Pongo had amazing innovations with the list. And then you had Hire come in with his larger big flip kin and version, which jumps in these giant creatures and that like repopularized the deck and gave a new life and apart from that like the it's a two mana commander that comes down makes a ton of mana has a super efficient combo with basalt monolith kind of gets around all the weak parts of these colors and yes you're in green and you can't play collector roof but that's fine because you can play all this really efficient interaction because you're playing a two mana commander as early as turn one quadrupling your your mana production not really it's only doubling it but the the potential mana is so high and then you're flipping into your win cons you have these hole breaker horror outlets you have infinite mana isochron scepter outlets you have the basalt monolith things like we talked about 
super easy ways to combo the fact that you can kill it three times and it only costs eight mana and then you're refunding your mana because it's doubling your mana is like insane yeah i think the commander is really good um it's really hard to argue that this is like maybe the best one we've talked about so far as i mentioned nimrus is probably in this contention here but like it's hard to argue with the historic value of kinnon riel is really interesting because when it first came out, it was really, really popular. It, a lot of people wanted to like make it work. And it's just always been really underwhelming. You can only really win with Underworld Breach. So every time I would play against a Riel deck for like a really long time, especially when I was like playing Dawn Waker against it, I would always be like, all right, Riel is going to help us control the board. If anything, it might look like it's really ahead at some points in the game. But then if you remove Underworld Breach from their access, you basically make it so the deck can't win. And I've seen some people win with, like, actual real damage, putting cards like Wonder in your graveyard to give it flying or, like, playing Wingcraft or weird stuff like that. But the, I just think the card is, like, it does a lot of cool stuff. It's super gimmicky. It does the thing really well. And it does an inherently powerful thing where you're, like, turning the downside on these cards, like, like ba Bazaar of Baghdad or even Wheels. And now you're, like, drawing 14 cards with your Wheels and stuff like that and, and turning these cards with, like, really bad downsides into just really solid filtering effects but all that being said it is severely limited by the win cons present and it helps you dig for these win cons really well because of all the filtering you can do but it doesn't mean the win cons it has are particularly spectacular so because of that i think it's probably better than zinder split but like maybe worse than minskin boo yeah it feels about right and I know Linden of Into the North has been doing a lot of work with this card recently, but it still hasn't really like shaped my opinion on it in any positive way. Uh, Winota is hard to speak about objectively, right? Because I am like the Winota pilot, but it is the second most winning deck in CEDH as far as actual results. And I think that speaks for itself. The card is inherently broken. It went from, oh, hey, Boros is a playable color to, oh, hey, Boros is a tier one archetype to, oh, hey, Winota is a problem that people are shifting the metagame around to, okay, well, now people are overcorrecting to face against this deck and it's still winning some games to now the format balancing out again to be like, okay, Winota will win games. It is the deck that I pilot when I know I really want to perform well in a tournament. It's just, it, it feels almost like a, like a guarantee when I know that like, I'm, I'm going to play Winota today. And because of how powerful the card is, I'm going to win a lot of games today. And it's as simple as that. I, I think the card is really good. Obviously being a good pilot with the deck has insane dividends, but it's also super intuitive for new players. It's one that I've seen people play like self-described worse versions of and still do well in tournaments. So yeah, it's hard to argue. Like the card itself is cracked and white is actually really strong in the current metagame. Rule of law effects are so easily broken parody on with this deck. Uh, it Yeah, Winota is just so strong and it's it's an S tier commander. I'd, like there's no argument in my mind that it is not an S tier commander. And that is with me trying to be critical of this card. I think it is one of the probably like top archetypes in the entire format obviously putting it up here in s tier that that is strictly indicative of that but there are going to be very few decks that i put up in this s tier category and i think winota is is one of those i think it is not that hard to see that um the results once again speak for themselves and i think the deck speaks for itself it's it's very easily an s tier commander yorian yorian's really really interesting i didn't think it would ever be a cedh deck uh it kind of did one of those no one talked about it for a long time and then sick robot of into the north started playing it and then he started playing it a lot and it's really cool it's a really unique deck it's got a lot of really cool value stuff you get to flicker your whole board and play cards like charming prince and restoration angel and like do these really cool flicker loops and slowly oppress your opponents out of it but that being said boy does it take a long time to kill your opponents and when you take a long time to kill your opponents and you slowly like death by a thousand cuts them you really open up a lot of opportunities for them to get out from underneath what you're doing and because of that, it really can't be anything higher than like, uh, it, once again, these decks that are have a hard time winning the game probably go in this C category, right? So like Raph can probably win the game a little cleaner than Yorian, but Yorian has a much stronger engine going than, than Raph. So I think like right here under Varals, which has a very clean game plan, Yorian has a clean game plan, but it just takes forever to actually just do the darn thing, which is kill your opponents. <laughs> Zerda! Love it in the 99, hate it as a commander. 
for a really long time, people were trying to play this as like infinite mana basalt, grim monolith combo in the command zone. Then you play like a walking ballista or like a goblin rocket launcher or whatever that card is. And you can tutor decently in those colors, but you need multiple pieces to make it work. It does decently under rule of law, but it provides you no real card advantage in the command zone. It doesn't help you with stacks. It doesn't really help you with tutoring. It has nothing that really does anything apart from like being half of a combo that you still need a third piece for. So uh, Rurikthar is probably better than this, but I will never say that this card's worse than Aurelia. <laughs> Another extremely underrated archetype here, Captain Sisse. As I mentioned, like with Joyra, um, the banning of Paradox Engine hit this deck really hard. It was like a tier one deck before that. And then Paradox banning like really, really hurt this deck. Choir Boy has spent hundreds and hundreds of games making this back into a solid contender in CEDH and playing it very, very well. And I think there's even a different version of this deck that exists that is very different than the one he's playing that is much heavier into like the win con list stacks version. And that has really been way underexplored. Choir Boy's version is way underexplored by any other person apart from him. Yeah, I, I think this, this card is actually really, really underrated and very, very powerful. And to me, I think this goes like in this area. Uh, crazy enough. I think this is just super strong and is is a very overlooked commander that is very, very good at what it does. Yeah, I think better than Anya, to be honest. So like, yeah, maybe Arami will give it a run for its money. But like, yeah, super high of B tier. And that's going to be a controversial pick, I know, for a lot of people. But that's that's where I see it. I think it's actually way underrated. It's a really good card. Kells the Fight Fixer. This is the most perhaps boring Demir option we have. It is just an infinite mana outlet in the command zone. It sort of just does a very bad value game where you can draw some cards when you sacrifice stuff. Yeah, not a big fan of this card. I know there were definitely people who were for some time, but uh, it's so such a boring card. And if I'm going to be doing Demir stuff, I'm going to be trying different things and not making my game plan. Like if I'm going to not play a four color deck and try and play a good stuff deck, then I'm at least going to like have something interesting in the command zone, like a really efficient creature coming down at two mana or graveyard synergies at three or pirate synergies that also refund itself a little bit, making it efficient to cast and providing consistent card advantage, not like really bad Isochron outlet card advantage. So, oh man, yeah, like low B tier probably like can win the game easier than I I'm trying to not let my distaste for this card affect how good it is. But it's so obvious what it does. It's really hard for me to be like, yeah, you should play this card in a competitive setting because it's just it's just worse than other options. And it doesn't it, it's not like it has a gimmick that allows it to be stronger in a certain area. It's, it's just really fine at everything, but not in a way that excites me. It's not like, yeah, it's good at everything it tries to do. It's like it, it's fine. So for me, like I can't put it in C tier because it's much better than that. It's probably better than Okan's Ender Split, much more consistent than Riel, has real win cons. Probably more consistent than Minsk and Boo. Same with Joyra does the thing in the command zone so much easier. So like maybe here, but I have a feeling people are going to yell at me for this one because it's it's on paper technically a good card, but I, I would literally m play most other of these archetypes in B tier than ever touch this commander because I don't think it provides you any strategic advantage apart from being a blue black deck. Like that is all it does. Karanos. This was like the default blue moon commander for a really long time. And I wanted to mention it here because historically it was really cool. It's unfortunately like heavy fringe now, which is kind of sad. Uh, I would love to see someone like pick it up again and like do some cool stuff. And I know people were trying reality scramble version of this deck, like flipping into an omniscience uh, for a bit, which is pretty cute. It doesn't make it like a good deck though, <laughs> unfortunately. So we're probably going to probably worse than Tygan, probably worse than Nira, probably worse than Ragadraga. So like, yikes down here, which is so sad. It's such a cool card. Next is a card I, I really like that I think is very underrated, but I've never like put the time in to like master because it's it's very commander centric. So it's Brago. It does the flicker thing, right? So you play all your mana rocks and then Brago hits and you reset all the mana rocks. You get to break parity on super cool cards like Stasis. And um, I'm aware super cool cards like Stasis might be a controversial opinion, but I, lo I love cards like Stasis. You can have your to the battlefield tutors keep doing their thing over and over again kind of cool because like you can play a fair thassa's oracle to gain card advantage and it layers really well with the fact that you probably want to play the shift lash archetype and it layers with all of your strionic resonator combos 
actually pretty decently. So the deck makes a lot of sense when you put it together. I think it's just sort of been built one way for a really long time and no one has innovated anything crazy on it for a while that that has made it substantially different. That being said, I think it has a lot of potential and I think it's maybe up here in this like high C tier range with the potential to be a little better because it has a much cleaner game plan than Yorian despite Yorian doing its thing pretty decently and hard to say it's better than I think it's better than Brawls, maybe even Edric too because it's like it it's just cleaner i think than those decks but i don't know i can say that it's better than grenzo because grenzo at least has speed on its side uh valky is a it's a cool card i know sage was really into this commander for a long time basically like playing tybalt in the command zone the backside so you would have these like ad nauseum hands that if you didn't have an ad nause or a bolus of citadel as your payoff you could just flip the backside of tybalt which just slowly oppressed your opponents out of the game it's fine. It did the thing really well. Uh, it was very efficient in what it did. Kind of worse than Grenzo, because Grenzo at least has a bunch of different layering options. So Valky feels like it goes around here just because of the strength of black turbo strategies right now. It's like one of the worst ways to do that thing, but it, it does it just fine enough. Sick Robot was really into Cole for a while. I, I saw him play it a good amount of times. It does the thing, it's just tough because it loses to a lot of stuff that are anti-meta stuff right now. So like it loses really badly to Collector Oof and Rule of Law and Dranith Magistrate and any sort of taxing effect, all of those things. So it combos really well and it can combo decently quickly given the speed of Boros in general. And all the tutor is like tutor for the right stuff because it's equipment based, but it's still in the current metagame is suffering or the way that the meta is right now and specifically the anti-meta hate right now because it's not going to be faster than your Adnaz decks but it will be it's definitely sneakier I will say than your Adnaz decks right like a lot of people don't know how to fight a coal but they know how to counter an ad nauseum and also to be said like it doesn't rely on a lot of instants and sorcery so cards like flusterstorm and dispel and swan song aren't as effective as they would be against a turbo deck but it still suffers as I said like a lot of the proactive pieces really hit this deck hard so think it's somewhere like probably better than Raph, probably better than Yorian in this sort of like is fast but doesn't do it in a great way right now sort of thing. Gliss of the Trader. I used to play a lot with Millie and Little E who's like the person who plays this deck a good amount. Unfortunately it just it never did the thing it wanted to do. It was so close to doing the thing a lot of the time but I think it's a suspicious archetype we'll say and I think it was definitely not as popular because of that because it, it just didn't have a clean way of winning the game and that's sort like the Rurik Thar thing like it just didn't do it well Heart the Lion is a personal pick I I'm going to put it here under Glissa because Glissa at least was like research better. But Karth, I just think it's really cool. It has this like weird into the battlefield, gets you some planeswalker things. You can play some stacks pieces. I just think it's underexplored, like very, very underexplored. And I think it does a really unique thing in the color combination. There's a lot of planeswalkers that have sacrifice abilities, like literally the next card we're going to talk about. So the fact that it like can tutor up your Hulk sacrifice pieces makes it kind of cool. I would need to spend more time on this card for me to like really feel confident putting it anywhere else than this category. But but once again, putting putting a deck that I'm interested in in the suspicious category because, uh, you know, I, I want to keep things honest while we're here. Grist is like a worse Varals in a good amount of ways, but also has some upsides when compared to Varals. So it's really good at getting Protean Hulk into the graveyard, but Varals is much cleaner as a sack outlet. But Grist does sacrifice your own creatures to kill something, right? So it, it is at least a one-time sack outlet. Grist was one of my decks for the MLC. I had a lot of fun playing it. I'm really, uh, I'm a huge Planeswalker fan. So the fact that there is this like playable two color planeswalker that does a unique thing in the command zone is really cool for me and it does the the thing it's trying to do fine enough it is definitely like worse than Barals. it's probably worse than valky and cole but it wins a lot better than something like yorian does so i think this is probably a really solid area for it lanis is classic archetype i am so suspicious of it it's in blue green which are very solid colors but like it's a creature artifact strategy that's like way worse than kinnon is at being this bad hybrid of the two and the combos that people describe for this card need like six different moving pieces and they don't always have to be the same moving pieces so it's not like unplayable but it's 
it's pretty rough. I don't know. It doesn't do anything great. <laughs> and I don't really get it because it's bad card advantage in the command zone. It has limitation on how many times it can do stuff. Uh, it's just, it's not a great card. And I don't really understand uh, how it's been on the database for so long because I don't really think it's a, a great archetype. I would love for someone to correct me on it, but I, I've been super underwhelmed every time I've seen this card in play. Sithis is... A card that was popular when it first came out uh, in MH2. It's another one of these has a really hard time winning the game combos. It's our first like Enchantress CEDH deck, which is super cool because it's an archetype we wanted for a long time. But I don't think it does a good job of it. Like it, it is a cheap Enchantress effect in the command zone. But that being said, I don't think it does anything. I, I have yet to see a Sithis deck like actually win the game <laughs> so for me that's pretty sus if you're a cdh commander can't actually win and the combos people have described to me are like enchantment cloudstone curio loops which is kind of wild and not something i imagine does really well so i'll put it like low c tier probably under nath knowing that like it it does cool stuff and like has probably a lot of potential it plays like collector of stones silence which is cool but like yeah it, it definitely needs something else for it to be an archetype I want to ever sleeve up. Chainer is super cool. This is a Morgan special from Into the North. Morgan played this deck at least to one smaller tournament. I know it's playing a good amount and did like top forward with it, I think. It's, it's a very cool archetype. It makes this like really weird necrotic ooze conspicuous snoop combo happen from the graveyard which i think is pretty interesting uh, it turns buried alive into like a bunch of one card combos and stuff like that so it's a very cool card uh, it does some unique stuff the deck's pretty interesting it's very good at like preying upon mid-range metas because like it's it's not going to ever like outspeed a turbo deck but the sort of mid-range reanimation plan is really good against other mid-range decks. So uh, I'm willing to like, I know this is a very unspoken about commander, but I think like I'm, I'm willing to put it in this like maybe worse than Grenzo, but maybe maybe Zinder Split and Okana's in the wrong area. I don't know because maybe it hasn't proven itself enough, but like maybe I just put this down here and then accept that Grenzo is just a bad B tier commander. These, these two are somewhere like this, but um, yeah, yeah, it all feels about right. Now, see, now I'm bad myself because now I'm like, Zendrisplay might not be better than these guys either. The Mighty are falling. Zendrisplay's just fallen pretty far down these rankings now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I don't know if Chainer can be beat. Maybe it's, maybe it's the best C-tier commander for now. Being a little better than Grenzo? No, I think Grenzo has to be better. Yeah, something like that. It's that's it's probably like these combinations of things. I think Grenzo is just a little cleaner. Old Stick Fingers. Old Stick Fingers is very, very interesting to me because it does a unique thing, but the inability to play creatures in a green deck is such a wild restriction to me. I have seen at my local shop someone play a Stick Fingers deck and play it to a, a reasonable amount of success, which was really cool to see. But that being said, Stick Fingers is it's just fine. It's doing its thing. It's not too crazy. Probably worse than the other Golgari options. Like, I'd rather be playing Protean Hulk stuff because this loses to a lot of stuff that other Golgari decks don't lose to. And because of that is just kind of worse than a lot of other Golgari options. That being said, I think it's still a solid C tier option. <sighs> Maybe not. Maybe this is a fringe deck. There's a chance it's the best fringe deck that we have. Yeah, that feels very right. Dragonlord Ojitai. I think this card is super underexplored. I think it's an interesting mid-range Staxi deck. I think it's been built sort of in a bunch of weird ways historically. I know Callahan from the Mind Sculptors was working on this card for a bit, but then liked the Jeskai Krom variant, or, or Jeskai Arden specifically, a little bit more. And I think that version was a little heavier on the equipment, which is how they were building this commander and obviously uh, this this one definitely has a soft spot in my heart because it's always been one of my favorite cards but i think it it is strong enough that it could lead this sort of mid-range stacksy deck with a few counter spells and a lot of stacks pieces and uh just sort of punch people to death in the command zone interested to see if it could ever get there but it's definitely definitely fringe but it has potential and i like that about it i think it's better than sten probably better than belby i think i'll put it here in the fringe category oscar trash daddy 
themselves. Uh, Oscar was a deck that I played for a little bit. I had decent success with it. It's weird because it's Demir, but it doesn't have card advantage in the command zone. But what it does do is some really broken stuff with cards like Necrolagia and with Necropotence. The reason I stopped playing this archetype was not because it wasn't good, because it was. It was actually really solid at doing what you wanted it to do. It was a very unique commander. I would love to see someone else play this deck because I think it's really strong and really unique and does some really, really cool stuff. The problem with it is that it's very hard to pilot correctly because of the way the cleanup step works. You basically say, I'm going to discard all of these cards from my hand and Oscar triggers for each and every one of them. And to technically execute your line correctly, you have to set the order in which you're going to cast every single one of your spells that aren't in your hand. So the ability to miss sequence in a technical game, like in a tournament game with this deck is so high. Like it is so easy to screw this up because it's not like you can be like, oh, wait, let me think about the sequencing now that I'm in the middle of my chain. You're, the order in which you're going to cast your spells is established. Now, don't get me wrong. You can do crazy stuff like draw 40 cards off a of Necropotence and or not maybe not 40 because you'd actually die, but like draw 35 cards off of Necropotence and win in the cleanup step or in the end step. But <laughs> because of that, it's, as I mentioned, very, very difficult to play. That being said, if someone can play it correctly, this is easily a solid B tier commander, like up, up in this area. Because of how hard it is, I think it has to be like very low in B tier. Because it wins better than a card like Riel, I'm gonna put it like here. Yeah, I just it's so cool and it does a really unique thing. And it it makes a lot of like cool cards have much more utility. There's also like stuff you can do where you like discard a doomsday at end step to like do that. There's a lot of unique stuff from this commander allows you to do. It's like the best shadow bag commander ever printed. But in general, it's a really cool card. It creates a really unique archetype. It's blue black, so it's very strong. It plays into our cards that like were never playable before. So yeah, it's just it's a really awesome card and I'm glad it exists. And I'm gonna put it in this like low B tier area just because of how difficult it is to play perfectly. And turns out like it's really hard to play decks perfectly in general it's it's hard to sequence against your opponents perfectly not only to mention like playing your own deck being an extra layer of challenge on top of that is a struggle like in a less competitive setting in like a like a cedh but not tournament setting this deck's awesome and i highly suggest people try it because it's really fun and if you have that play group that is like really supportive about like helping you sequence stuff correctly and like learning this will help you do that for sure <laughs> shark eye is the best blue white commander period shark eyes freaking awesome it makes cards like unwinding clock great it makes mana fold key and voltaic key like playable cards again because when i first started cdh those cards were played a ton in artifact decks and now they're not played at all you can break parity on cards like humility you have proteus staff wins you have polymorph wins uh, you don't have to even play those which i tend to actually like creature including versions of shorakai better you can play displacer kitten combos you can play isochron scepter combos you can play artifact untapped tapping combos you can play like really janky intruder alarm combos with this card the fact that it allows you to have card advantage and bodies on the battlefield every time it gets activated it has haste technically because of the fact that it's an artifact it's a hull breaker horror outlet so brilliant for a blue white card it fits the color pie so well. I, I have nothing but great things to say about this card. You do feed Dockside's pretty bad is the biggest downside of it for sure. That being said, like, I think it's better than niv -Mizzet. I think it's just, maybe people aren't building it 100% correctly, but I think it's like one of these high B tiers. Like, I, this card's super good. Probably even above Sisse. And it's like above blue-black decks and like decks that have put up results before. I don't know if everyone's like able to play Shurikai at 100%, but I think this card's awesome. And I think it's really, really underrated. And I think it's very strong. And it's like definitively the best blue-white option by a country mile, as you can see by the other options we have here. High B tier, super solid. Big, big fan of that card. Grease Fang. I know some people were excited about this card when it first got printed because you can do stuff like Entomb a Parhelion and then you can play like anti-creature reanimation stuff but still have your vehicles come back from the graveyard. I think it's a classic archetype I'm suspicious of despite being a popular option. Sorry Cal of the Mind Sculptors. I know you love this card but yeah for me it's like solid here. Not 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 a fantastic archetype. Alonis being better than Rurikthar and 
Grease Fang is maybe a little suspicious. There we go. That feels right. There we go. Um, Locust God. I know at some point people were playing this as like a budget CDH deck. I think it has more potential than that. I think it has other combos that other, uh, you know, decks don't have access to. It's six mana is super expensive. That being said, it's kind of cool. And it was just a card that like I was looking through blue red options that people hadn't played in a really long time. And this definitely is like very fringe. I think it'd be like a really good starting CDH deck if you're like, I played Locust God and Casual and wanted to like bring my wheels deck and then add infinite mana outlets into it and have the fast mana pay off for me really well. So I think it's like here-ish. Yeah, like there. It's fine. Usury, Fortune's Flame. It was a card I was very excited about when it was printed. The tough part is it doesn't really have any win conditions. It's just really cool because you flip a bunch of coins and if they all land in your favor, you draw a ton of cards, but if not, you take a bunch of damage. It's it's not great, but it's like a really unique tempo deck. It's definitely a fringe archetype, as I mentioned, but a fringe archetype worth mentioning here. It's a CEDH deck in, in that sense, right? Like you can play a breach line, things like that, but it, it's a little clunky, but very cool. It, I think it's just a unique card. Uh, probably like it here. All right, Circu. So Circu was like one of the best blue-black outlet infinite mana Isochron Scepter commanders for a long time because you didn't even have to like make more than two mana. You can only make enough mana to activate Isochron infinite times without having to actually net mana and you would exile your opponent's entire library. It's better than obviously milling your opponents out. So in that sense, it's kind of cool, but it doesn't have any card advantage. It doesn't really do anything for you in the command zone. I know at one point it was sort of like this top deck control deck, like the lantern control deck in modern, but it's like a, it's like a classic fringe deck, right? It's, it's worse than other options that are available, but it does something just fine enough. And it's in blue black and it has historical consult, right? Like it's, you should be playing another blue black deck if you're playing blue black with the intention of winning, but I don't know, it's, it's fine. <laughs> and obviously like the lantern control stuff was kind of cute. Um, and I would love to see if that ever like got better. Lavinia, hey Cal, sorry friend. Now Lavinia is just, Lavinia is a great piece in the 99. It should not be a commander. Having just a pure stacks piece in the commander that doesn't provide you any card advantage is not great. Probably better than like Thanos and probably better than Karanos, maybe worse than Ragadraga. Yikes, it's not a good place to be, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Might be better than Usury. Usury might be too high on here, is the is the other issue. Thanifar, super cool in the 99. Awesome if you can give it haste with a card like Kenrith. It's really cool to have a birthing pod in the command zone, but it's not yet at the place where the combos and the lines aren't very, very clunky. And until it gets some really efficient, like clean birthing pod lines, it's probably not gonna be amazing. So that being said, it's a very unique and strong fringe deck, but probably nothing more than that. Daryl, another solid fringe list. It's really cool. It does something unique. It's pretty decent with Conspicuous Snoop. It's really good into metas where mana dorks are a lot better than they are currently in the meta. So if we were back in the meta that like Curiosity Control was originally brewed in, where like Pyroclasms were super strong, this deck would be a, kind of a real thing. And you get to break parity on like a number of different stacks effects. That being said, it's not great. And it's a really cool option and a very underexplored option in my opinion, but it is a fringe deck for sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll do something like that. Glenn, Glenn's a, another Walking Dead commander. Um, it's an Azorius option. I think it's just super underexplored. So that being said, I'm gonna put it here-ish. I, I think it is just people have not spent enough time brewing this commander, but like the Ophidian effect where you're just hitting a, a player and drawing like a certain amount of cards, depending on what the damage is, can probably yield better dividends than it has been proven to do historically. Um, it's probably like one of the best Umazawa's GTA commanders because you can have it have this skulk thing and then you can pump it before damage uh, to do some like draw like five cards basically. So it's unique, but it hasn't been explored enough to really be a thing. Next, shout out to Alan of Mental Misplay for Delsum here. Delsum is a super solid card. It's one of those cards that the more Alan played this in pods I was in, I would be like, wait, that card does that thing? Huh, that's kind of weird. It just does a lot of stuff, has a bunch of lines of text, it's a bit of a parasitic deck because it sort of plays well when there is a stacks deck at the table slowing everybody down. On its own, I think it just gets absolutely steamrolled by Turbo Adnaz decks. And it's a little, like, it's cutesy and has a lot of cute stuff going on. But at the same time, if you let the deck steamroll at all or get any sort of momentum building, it really runs away with the game very, very fast because of all the card draw. So 
with that being said, it's kind of got like some aspects of Timna, but it's also hexproof at certain points and like provides evasion to certain creatures, but they need to have reach, so they're not always the best creatures. All in all, it's a cool card. Definitely fringe, but provides some uh, some unique stuff for the format. Probably like here. The Gitrog Monster. This is one I know people are going to yell at me for. I think the average performance of the strength of this deck is not always indicative of the people playing it. And by all of that, I mean, I don't think the Gitrog Monster 95% of the time is piloted to the best of its capabilities. So it's hard to rate because I've seen some really, really good players play this deck and make me very, very scared of it. It is one of those decks that if it gets left alone at all, it wins the game. So you have to respect it. So with that being said, I've seen this deck get king made a lot because it's not the first deck to go off, but it's often harder to interact with and therefore the second deck to go off because it wins with creatures a lot of the time so because of that it's really interesting it's it's a very strong deck it's definitely better than like itrog's probably like in this space it's like it's too good not to keep up to this high mid b tier but it also gets hit by a good amount of interaction from what your opponents are doing and it's very difficult to play perfectly and correctly so i think we're gonna throw it like here Kit Rock's fine like it, it's just fine it does a lot of stuff it does some unique stuff and it has the ability to steal games if your opponents like slip up at all which is something you want from your deck right in a multiplayer game the ability to capitalize on your opponents making a mistake is really huge so that's awesome. Dina, half of an infinite combo, also a Protein Hulk sacrifice outlet. Doesn't provide any card advantage, but it does what it needs to do in the command zone. I haven't really seen a list that like super overwhelms me with value or the like need to, to play it a bunch, but it's fine. It does what it's trying to do just fine enough. It's probably better than like Stick Fingers. I think a little better than Sithis probably better than Nath, but like maybe here on the C tier, it's just fine. Elzeth Prismari was one people were excited about, another Urza knockoff that just kind of went nowhere because the way you have to build it is kind of awkward. It does really cool stuff with like Dockside Extortionist, but the restrictions on it kind of limit it a little too much. So unfortunately I think it's kind of in this like heavy fringe category, but I, I think at some point they're gonna print something that makes this card a lot better. And when they do, I'm excited to go back to it. Galia is just a super heavy fringe commander. It was played a good amount because it broke Snoop Piles, but now Gruul has printed a bunch of different options. Uh, there's still one on the database though, so I figured I'd show where I think it goes. <laughs> Kroxa, uh, one of my first loves in CEDH. I adore this deck. It's a World Gorger outlet. It did this really unique like discard hand control stuff that during the time of Flash was like actually really good at disrupting your opponent's game plans while they're all sort of playing this like sandbag thing going on. Yeah, and it's it's cheap and efficient to get down. You always knew you had discard in the command zone. It came back as this like really potent clock if you were able to cast it for its escape cost. Probably better than Mizzix, maybe better than Raph, close to Yorian. Uh, in, in a Pyroclasm meta, this deck is a lot better. So in the current meta, I think you can play a pretty decent version that's like up by this Grist, Cole, Zinder split space. Like, I think like, yeah. But definitely Crocs is a solid deck and one that I used to spend a lot of time playing. Gattacteague is an archetype that is like one of those old infamous casual decks, right? That like would always be like, oh, well they played a Gattacteague and I couldn't have fun playing a commander game. But then when translated to CDH, it's actually not that great. I, I've never really, like, really been impressed by a Gattacteague list. And uh, we talked about earlier how like having a stacks piece, no matter how specific in the command zone, isn't fantastic. I was thinking about trying this recently. But then like when you think about things like, oh, I can just tutor this with Sisse, it's like, why play this in the command zone when I can get other green white options? And green's so good at tutoring creatures, like why play this instead? So it's it's pretty fringy. Probably worse than the deck with Thassa's Oracle. Galazeth feels maybe way too overrated. Yeah, bring that way down. Toxrill. When this card came out, it was all the hype. It's a fine blue black commander. I think other blue-black options do this thing better. It's probably still the best blue-black scepter outlet. Vohar is worth comparing to, but Vohar can't have summoning sickness and be an Isochron outlet, whereas Toxroll doesn't care. So it's definitely in this high B tier area. I think it's probably better than Arami. Maybe. No, I think Arami's probably better, but like I think all three of these blue-black options are like here. Given the fact that like Toxrill 
is so good when it does its thing as a board control piece, but seven mana, seven mana, and we kind of have to be realistic about the fact that that is really, really hard to cast. <laughs> like, really hard to cast. Aruth, Josh of Mind Muscle Magic loves this card as much as I do. It's just so hard to make happen consistently. It's a, it's a deck that I think is CEDH, and it's really fun to play on, like, the fringe competitive tables. Um, I would probably play it over something like Zancha, maybe. It's close to a Vanifar. It like does really cool stuff, like the ability to like play like a control the court and uh, exile eight cards at the top of your library and then discard nothing because your hand is already discarded uh, and like turns all of these card draw cards that are kind of bad, like breakthrough into like draw eights for one mana. So it's like super unique, does a really cool thing, is definitely competitively viable, but it definitely lives in this fringe zone because it's so inconsistent. And if you ever get hit with a Dranith Magistrate, you're literally locked out of the game. Prolock is a love of mine. It's so fun. It lets you play a bunch of really unique cards. You get to play a Hermit Druid plan. You play like several different layered mill my entire library plans. Is it ever going to be better than a four color Hermit Druid deck? No, but I think this is like one of the better C tier options, probably comparable to this like Brago, Edric, Chainer space. It's really consistent at doing what it does. It has a lot of flexibility. Grolnock is a card advantage engine in the command zone. So I think we're looking like right here-ish. I love Grolnock. It's a really, really cool card. It's it's just adds really fun stuff to the competitive format. And uh, yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about this card. It's so fun to play. Uh, Overstain, a classic. I'm sus of this card, Commander. People were playing it for a while as like a food chain commander for green black. And it's just like, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. There's so many way less clunky things you can be doing in CEDH. And Rustain just seems like the clunkiest of all clunky options. Anawan, uh, one of my most popular videos on this channel that was my deck tech on this card. And I think they're still printing more rogues every single set, more good rogues. And at some point, this card is going to be really good or not even really good, but good enough where you're just playing a bunch of good, high card quality cards. Uh, you know, Douthy Voidwalker was a huge printing for this deck, but the more rogues that are printed, the more this gains some strength. Once again, it's blue black, so it can only be so bad because you're playing consultation with card advantage in the command zone. You're also anthemming your creatures, which can provide sort of board advantage and control there. You're filling up graveyards for Mononic Betrayal. You have sort of inherent rogue synergies uh, with cards like Knowledge Exploitation and stuff like that. You can play your Adnaws. So uh, this deck can only be so bad. Uh, so I think it's like sort of here-ish but with the expectation that this could easily be like a solid B tier option at some point. Uh, Sig is kind of a bad card advantage engine in blue black. It's like much worse than a lot of blue black options. It doesn't really provide you with anything, but it's an ability that is easy to trigger. So like anytime someone loses a mana crypt flip, you're like, oh, I'm going to draw a card off Sig at the end step. And it's a rogue, so it's better in the end one. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's fine. It's pretty underwhelming. I don't know why you would ever play this as a blue black commander is kind of my thing. Like it's not even like, doing a fun unique thing like something like Lazav here does. Una is a classic commander. It is worse than other options that exist in blue black now, which is so sad because like here's this classic option that's like just not good anymore. It is definitely something to be said that like you can bring that to a table and people will be like, "Oh, well, you don't have to worry about Una at the table. Like it's just going to do its thing and you can ignore it." Unfortunately, it's just a it's a fringe commander now and it's hard to call it anything else because there are just better versions of its effect that exist. Like even even Circu is kind of cleaner than this. Sad. Sad day for Una. Yasharn is a very solid stacks deck, and it is a stacks deck that provides a lot of advantage in the sense that it shuts down way more cards than you think it does. It shuts down fetch lands, it shuts down treasures, it messes with a lot of really weird stuff and it stops your opponents doing things. Now in the command zone, I don't know if this is what you really wanna be doing. And once again, the every time we talk about a green white commander, I, I always go back to why wouldn't you just play Captain Sisse and tutor it out of your command zone? And you know, maybe that's not the best way to look at every single green white commander, but that's kind of a way to interpret it, right? But your Sharn is very, very strong. Like it has a super strong effect and it's often not played because it is so hard to play around. <laughs> it's just, it's very, very powerful. I think it's like a solid C tier option, probably close to this Brago. Eh, Grolnock and Brawls are probably a little better than it. Maybe Anawan is too. But it probably lives around here with the potential of being better. Like the fact that it also hits your land drops, which is super important as a stacks player to always hit your land drops. The the deck scales really strangely. Like a turn one or two Yasharn is super great. 
Like it, it, it does exactly what you want it to do to the game. But anything later than that makes the card feel like infinitely worse. So that's kind of why it can't really ever get up to this like B tier zone because it just it needs the tempo of the game to be in its favor very very much so and if it is once again that's awesome but if it isn't then mm, it's a little harder to justify um and then also i don't have it here but i realized that Marin of the clan neltoth which will be the second copy of tatiova Marin is really really solid at like doing its thing provides a great value plan i've had alan of mental misplay kick my ass with it at least once, if not more. The fact that it turns Buried Alive into just like a combo that wins that turn is really cool. It just does a good solid graveyard value thing. It can play some stacks pieces like Collector Roof and things like that. So Tatiova 2, also known as Marin of the Clan Nelta, that card will probably find itself sort of, it's it's probably like worse than Varals and Enuan and Yasharn here, maybe worse than Valky. But uh, like in, in this-ish space, uh, you know, better than, yeah, probably like a little worse than Grist, but... Marin's cool, and you can do some cool Protean Hulk stuff, and it, it definitely, like, is really good at being a parasitic deck that, like, snowballs advantage over time. So I'd probably put it here, but I'm going to remove Tatiova so people don't get confused and think there's two Tatiovas here. And that is my tier list for every non-partner two-color commander in competitive EDH. We have our first S tier. I believe in total this brings us now to only four decks in a tier and yeah this is this was really fun to do again i just recorded this today because i was genuinely really excited to talk about all these cards you're probably seeing this broken into two parts because the recording alone is now hitting two hours um and yeah i i'm very happy about the fact that i was able to continue this series as i mentioned last time i did this for the monocolor deck if you like videos like this please make sure to hit like and subscribe comment down below if you have opinions on any of the things I mentioned here. I know last time people thought I was like really wrong about Marwyn. So I'm interested to see if any of these archetypes people play that I'm suspicious of commanders come back to me. I was, you know, trying to be really critical of decks that I'm a big fan of this time, you know, maybe even grading them lower than I thought they should have. And given that, uh, I put Winota in S tier, which I know some people are going to have their opinions of, but I think is, is almost irrefutable. Tell me what you think about these archetypes. Tell me what you think about the things in a, the things you think were way too highly evaluated. And I know some people thought my mono white evaluations were pretty generous last time. So I'd love to hear everyone's opinions on these things. And hopefully next I'm going to do the three colors. I'm probably going to go up the one, two, three, four, five colors, then tackle partners and uh, go from there. So thank you everyone for watching this. Uh, if you like videos like this, make sure to hit like and subscribe. If you want to support the channel so that I can do more stuff like this, so I can have more educated opinions of all the diverse decks in the format so that I have the chance to travel to these tournaments and see these decks in action, go to more game stores and to be able to play with more people to provide you this real content that is, is meant to actually be informative and helpful. Uh, if you really enjoy this stuff, please make sure to hit like and subscribe. And if you're feeling generous, check out patreon.com because that helps me get to these events. That helps me uh, spread my wings and, and do all of these different things to experience uh, CEDH so I can come back and report it to all of you here on the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Things that are coming up for me very soon. I am going to be a featured creator at Oktoberfest. And there I will be playing a uh, special round of Commander, which I'm going to, I think details will be revealed about that, that, but it will be quite the event to see. I'm also going to be part of a community panel there and participating in the main tournament. So that should be a really exciting time. Monarch has really started pulling out all the stops for these tournaments now that they're in person. So Oktoberfest that happens to be in November. So we've been joking that's Novo Oktoberfest. <laughs> uh, that'll be coming up pretty soon. And then I'll be at the MTG Summit, which is looking to be just a fantastic event with a ridiculous amount of content creators and a great opportunity for people who like want to meet the people who like make the content that they watch. I will be in the command zone for basically all of those days. I think I'm going to be doing a Brothers War pre-release event while I'm there, but I'm going to be in there playing CEDH games with all of my fellow uh, you know, content creators and CEDH players, and I will be looking for people to play with that whole time, and I'll be there just to jam games with y'all. So come come watch and play and, and meet me there because I'll be playing games with people all the time, and anytime there's events like this that aren't tournaments, but they're like these big social events, it's it just feels like a three-day party, and it's so fun. You get to meet so many new people. I've made so many friends at events like that, and I'm so excited to to go to the MTG Summit and to see all these amazing people who help make our, our community what it is. And if you're signing up to go and you use code Ian, which I'm going to put on the screen, that not only makes it so that your ticket 
is cheaper or anything that you buy in your cart to attend the MTG Summit, but it also uh, helps me go. <laughs> it, a little bit comes back to me and it's very helpful to pay for things like my flight to get there. So super appreciate it on my end. And once again, it makes your order cost less. So you're literally getting free money for typing in code Ian when you check out. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this two color tier list and I appreciate y'all showing up. Thank you so much and I'll catch you next time. Peace. I, I, I can feel the blood creeping up from the heathens. Got will, got fight, got pride, got reason. If they want to go eat, then you know I'm going to feed them. If you're coming for me, hope you're ready for a demon. I got eyes in the back of my head I'm seeing. Take me for granted and you know I'm leaving. I'ma take what's mine with the webs I'm weaving. I could take this crap from seeing to believe.